Great. Well, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the uh, Spring Webinars presented by InStone. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about InStone, and I really want to thank them for having us on, is uh, the way they strive for the amazing and the impossible. Uh, in today's case, they've asked me to take a about an hour and 45-minute presentation and pack it into one hour. So we're going to shoot for the impossible. We're going to have to move pretty quick. Um, so the presentation today is going to be based on uh, or is around manufactured stone, the warranty, and code. Uh, the reason that we cover that is the last thing we would want is for somebody to install a manufactured stone, uh, get completed with the project, have an issue sometime down the road, and when they reach out to the manufacturer, because one or two steps were missed, it voided the warranty. So we want to make sure we cover what it takes to meet uh, the manufacturer's warranty. The other part of it is around building codes. Building codes um, have been fairly stable, but sometimes there's some changes. I just want to make sure that we cover what it takes to meet a uh, building code that's out there. So again, my name is Jeff Tu. Um, I've been in the manufactured stone industry for a little over 20 years now. Uh, currently, I work for Boral. Uh, I love what we do, work in the stone division, and um, I am the director for the technical part of our business. Now, the presentation is going to be based off of these websites that you see listed. Uh, we'll put this back up at the end. We're really going to focus on the install guide that comes out from the NCMA. Now, again, we've condensed this presentation, so we're not going to be able to cover everything. I'm not going to be able to go as deep as we'd want to, and so I would suggest the best way for us to uh, cover the important things is ask questions. Uh, let's make sure we cover the information that you want to know about as we go through this today. Now, as we get started, uh, the first thing we usually like to talk about is around our safety. And if I get the slide to move forward, there we go. Uh, just a quick fun photo of how not to be safe. Uh, I think probably a few years ago, this would have been me standing on a handrail and a wall trying to put up a safety sign probably not the best way to do it. I think the good reminder for us, uh, whether we are trying to navigate through uh, this virus stuff now or when we're out on job sites, let's make sure we're looking out for ourselves. Let's make sure we're looking out for those that are around us. Let's be safe. Uh, if you're not familiar with Boral, we're a company that's based in Australia. Uh, in North America, we're more of an exterior cladding company, doing everything from clay and concrete roofing tile, uh, trim, siding, uh, brick and obviously manufactured stone. Uh, what we want to do is kind of set a foundation for our conversation today. We're going to be talking about manufactured stone veneer or MSV as it's often called. And we're going to take a quick look at the code requirements for the material itself. Right now we're basing or working off of acceptance criteria 51 and this ASTM specification. Essentially, what that calls out is a lot of the different physical properties of a manufactured stone, like it can't be any thinner than a quarter of an inch, can't average any thicker than two and five eighths. So you might see a stone that starts out at three inches and tapers down to two, but it needs to average two and five eighths or less. Can't be uh, any longer than 36 inches in one direction, uh, can't be any larger than five square feet in size. A really important one is making sure that its uh, weight is 15 pounds per square foot or less. Now, when we add that to scratch coat and lath, we usually figure that to be about eight to 10 pounds. So a system as it's complete can't weigh more than 25 pounds per square foot. Now, what that gives us the ability to do is to be considered an heared veneer stone. Um, at that point, as long as we're 25 pounds per square foot or less for the complete system, we can be installed uh, over wood framing, steel framing, typical 16 inch on center, and that wall system will carry the weight at no problem at all. When those weights go above the 15 and 25, that's where wall systems probably need to be adjusted to carry that additional weight. Now, when it comes to the actual installation process, this is just a example snapshot of what a building code would look like for manufactured stone. It's not very long right now. Uh, versions of the 2018 code uh, begin to expand out a lot further on what's required for installation. We see a lot of things like water resistive barriers should be installed per this section. And what we've done in this presentation is try to grab all that information so that you don't have to go look it all up. Um, we also want to take a minute to talk about 
probably one of the primary issues in building and in construction right now is moisture inside, moving through walls, um, in buildings in general. And moisture can move in a lot of different ways. Um, just something as simple as wind blowing on one side of a building uh, creates some positive pressure, some negative pressure on the opposite side. Our HVA systems move an awful lot of vapor and moisture through our buildings. Um, and probably one that we're very used to seeing is when we have a cold temperature outside and, and some warm temperatures inside or vice versa. Uh, when it's hot and humid outside and we've got our air conditioner running and we've got a much lower temperature and lower humidity on the inside. Uh, and then solar driven moisture is another one. All these uh, kind of add up to an important conversation around how we prepare our buildings, the flashings, the transitions, the uh, papers that we use. And if they're done improperly, we can get into some issues with claddings. And it's not just with manufactured stone. It can happen with stucco. It can happen with eaves. It happens with brick. In the picture that I was sent here, um, the gentleman's pointing out a crack in the stone, but I couldn't get past uh, what I was seeing up here. First of all, we have got uh, what looks to be a, a house wrap tape taping off that window. And I'll just tell you, as we all know, that's not the proper tape to flash off a window. It should be some self-adhered flashing there, some peel and stick tape. They do have two layers of paper that are required by code, and they've got flashing just down below it. The problem that we've got here though is that flashing is nailed on top of the two layers of paper. And now any water that gets behind the siding and travels down those papers are not gonna magically jump out on top of the flashing for us. They're gonna get driven back in behind that secondary black layer of paper and we're gonna have a water issue. There, uh, that flashing should either be tucked back in behind the primary WRB or some self-adhered flashing tape on top of it so that water travels down that uh, paper, gets directed on top of that uh, flashing piece and out over the face of the stone. This is a code requirement that anytime we make a transition between dissimilar materials that that horizontal transition there needs to be flashing that takes water from the cladding above, dumps it out past the face of the cladding below. The last picture uh, before we get started is uh, one that where a house had some uh, water issues on the inside. When they took the drywall off, uh, they've got arrows pointing to where a majority of the water was getting in. Now, manufactured stone is an absorptive cladding. It's not waterproof, uh, but that water should travel in and hit that secondary layer of paper, uh, travel down and get out of that wall system or dry out through the stone. If we've got improper uh, flashings at material transitions like they're pointing to the windows and to the door or in the areas where there is uh, electric coming through that wall in uh, for the light is another place where water and moisture could get in and so that's what we want to talk about today how do we keep water out of that wall system now we're going to base this off the NCMA's installation guide NCMA uh, installation guide, uh, first version came back out in 2006. We're working on the most current guide that came out in late 2019. This is what helps us make sure that we are meeting the installation requirement called out in this ASTM specification, C1780. Now, as we talk about building codes, we'll talk about them kind of more on a national level. We just wanna make a note to make sure you check your local codes. Uh, for any variances. And then a quick note around the silica regulations. OSHA has regulations around the silica dust that's created by cutting masonry, whether it's our stone, uh, brick, landscape stones, uh, any of those will kick up some silica dust. So please, let's be careful with this. Make sure we're using the proper masks. Make sure we're using uh, dust collection devices, vacuum saws, and so on. So as we get into this presentation, we try to split it up between wood and metal frame and masonry constructions, because how we install over masonry is gonna be different than how we install over framing. We'll start with masonry first. We'll define masonry as a CMU, board wall, tilt up wall, any type of masonry uh, backup system. You can apply a manufactured stone directly to it, as long as there's nothing there that would inhibit the bond of that mortar to the masonry surface. Things that could inhibit the bond are dirt and dust that have splashed up, uh, paint, sealers, form leases, any of those types of things would be a bond break. 
Now in that NCMA guide, they've got these really nice tables that will walk us through all the different types of backup systems and then what may or may not be required in order to install a manufactured stone over top of it. Um, and so again, it makes it really nice and easy. You don't have to remember every one of these details. Now they do show a brand new CMU wall. And as an option, they're saying you might want to put a sheet of metal lath over top of that. The reason is, is that masonry can move independent of a manufactured stone. They move at different rates sometimes. CMU will expand and contract, uh, brick continue to grow. Or in the case of this picture here, you can see that we've got some step cracking. And if we had installed our stone directly to that masonry, that cracking would have followed through all the way through the manufactured stone. So by shooting metal lath over top of it, that metal lath acts as a bond break, absorbs a lot of that movement, and typically doesn't pass all that cracking through to the stone. Uh, in order to shoot metal lath over top of it, we're gonna be looking for the same anchor pattern that we use in framing, 16 on center, about every six or seven inches vertically. And we wanna use a uh, corrosion resistant masonry anchor, typically a Tapcon or a ram set uh, to apply that metal lath. Now, when it comes to hoard walls and tilt up walls, because of the form release that's on those forms and then eventually on that masonry, uh, we treat this a little bit differently. We didn't try to recreate in a new process. All we do is point out to the International Concrete Repair Institute. They've got a technical guide on how to prepare any masonry surface for any application. But when it comes specifically to stone, we're going to be looking for a concrete surface profile or how rough that surface is. It needs to be equal to or greater than two. Now that International Concrete Repair Institute will show us that a CSP1 can be achieved with acid etching. In order to get that two, we need to actually grind it. Uh, we need to roughen that surface up enough so that mortar can bond with it. Uh, with the OSHA regulations around silica dust, uh, that can be a little bit more challenging, definitely a more time consuming. And so maybe in this situation, again, shooting metal lath over top might be the fastest or easiest way to do it. Again, TAPCON, uh, a RAM set, uh, I believe Senko even makes a gun that runs off an air compressor, so much faster, more efficient, and easier on the contractors. Just a couple of photos to show what it looks like when we install manufactured stone directly to a poured wall that still has the form release off uh, on it. Six months, six weeks, whatever it is, down the road, sheets of stone will start peeling off the wall because that form release does its job, it releases. This picture on the right, it is a formed wall. It just kind of has that brick texture. I think the contractor thought there would be enough texture there for the mortar to bite to. It's not. So, uh, when it comes to control joints and expansion joints, um, right now, when it comes to an expansion joint between two tilt up concrete walls, we do not want to install our stone over top of that expansion joint. Uh, they will move at different rates and cause cracking. Now, in this picture, the contractor uh, shot some grout in there. You can see the cracking from the movement between the two different walls that probably should have been left open and filled with a back rotted sealant. Now, when it comes to control joints, um, manufactured stone is working right now to kind of help come up with some definitions on where potentially control joints could go. But right now, we really leave that up to the design professionals that are out there. Um, most of the time in residential construction, uh, the code is fairly clear that we've got about 30 feet up with an additional eight if it's going into a gable. Commercial, on the other hand, not quite as clear. Uh, that does allow for a manufactured stone to go a lot higher. Um, but I would recommend that in a wood frame construction that's going up three, four, five, six stories tall, uh, there be some considerations for where those control joints would go. Some maybe off of the window, and then definitely some considerations around at the floors. If you think about it, we've got four, five, six stories worth of green. Uh, lumber used for the framing and the sheathing. We're going to come back and hang 20 pounds per square foot of additional weight between the stone and the scratch coat. And over the next year or so, as that green wood dries out and the weight that's on there causes that building to compress a little bit, there could be some buckling or damage in the stone. And that's a lot of times why a designer would include some type of a control joint, whether it's at every floor, every other floor, something to allow that uh, building to compress without causing damage to the stone. And I'll take a quick pause here as we wrap up the masonry and move on to frame construction. Any questions that we should handle? 
Jeff, we got one, and uh, you may touch on it later, but one question is, can you use Tyvek as one layer of WRB? And if so, what's an acceptable second layer? Yep, if we can hold off, I've got a couple of slides that'll speak direct, directly to the WRBs. So that's perfect. Perfect, I'll let you go. Great, we'll keep moving. Uh, in the installation guide, there again, uh, will be a table dealing with both interior and exterior framing. Uh, typical detail would look like this, sheathing followed by two layers of WRB, metal lath, scratch coat with the horizontal lines in it, setting mortar, and then the stone. Now, let's take a quick look at interior applications. Interior, if we're going to use metal lath, the recommendation would be to consider using a layer or two of WRB. It's not a requirement. It's a recommendation. The reason is, is we often shoot metal lath inside over plywood OSB or often drywall, and all of those are fine. But when we put our scratch coat on, the water that's in our scratch coat, there is a small potential that some of that water could soak into that sheathing. And now we've got a small potential for mold or mildew. So by introducing one or two layers of a WRB, the water that's in that scratch coat hits that paper, dries back out. Now on an interior application, if you wanna use cement board, that's fine. They are saying as an option, you might use a layer of WRB, that's not required again. But that cement board does, does need to be a proper half inch cement board. All the seams need to be taped with the fiber tape that that cement board manufacturer supplies, and that needs to be done with a modified mortar. And then the stones need to be set with a modified mortar. Now, if we're dealing with exterior application, we already went through the two layers that are required, the metal lath and the scratch coat. If we want to use cement board in an exterior application, in this case, there needs to be sheathing, followed by one layer of WRB. This is now required followed by a proper half inch exterior grade cement board, again, taped with the fiber tape from that manufacturer using a modified mortar to set that uh, stones into the cement board. Typically, we're seeing uh, plywood and OSB out there. We're also seeing some zip wall. All these are acceptable uh, sheetings for a manufactured stone. The one note we do make is around OSB. OSB, when it gets wet, it's Exposed to a lot of rain, uh, sometimes that OSB can swell and cause cracking in the stone. So let's make sure that we keep that OSB dry. Or if we notice that that OSB has gotten wet and is swelling, make sure that we get that OSB changed out before we install over top of it. At the bottom of any frame construction, code requires a weep screen. It needs to have a three and a half inch leg, and it needs to be installed at least one inch below the sill plate. Now, the purpose of a weep screed is two different things. One, any water that does make its way through the stone and scratch coat and gets to the papers can now travel down, and it's an exit point for that water. More importantly, it's a capillary break. We want to keep water from wicking up into the bottom of that wall system. If this is uh, buried down into grade and water is constantly wicking up into the bottom 8, 10, 12 inches of stone, number one, those stones are probably going to deteriorate a little faster. But more importantly, we're holding water against some WRB, some papers that are meant to keep water out. But if they are constantly saturated, some of those papers will start to deteriorate early. So it's important to have that weep screed uh, at the bottom of those frame constructions. We want to make sure that we don't bury our stone down into grade. In this case, it's mulch. Now water can't get out of the bottom of that system. Water definitely is going to continue to wake up. And in the case of mulch like this, there's a whole lot of bugs now living in next to this stone, trying to crawl up back in behind it. Now in this one, again, stone buried down into grade. Um, I tell folks, anytime we see the word exhibit above one of our installs, that's not a good thing, because now we know lawyers are involved. Code officials, uh, when homes are being sold, also uh, are looking to make sure that those weep screeds are in place. This last one, a little bit harder to tell, but this is a sidewalk. You can see the metal lap, you can see our paper has started to curl, and we can see how easily, easily water could run underneath that paper, get to that wall behind the stone, and start to wick up and cause damage to the sill plate and the framing. Now, when it comes to our papers, we're looking for two layers. Uh, we used to install over just one layer, often that was house wrap. What we found is that mortar uh, kind of bonds with the paper that it comes in contact with, 
And then that paper is not able to do its job very well. And for our primary WRB, which is meant to allow vapor to pass out, keep water from going in, it's what of all, all of our penetrations and flashings are tied into. It's important that that primary layer is pristine. And so we want to have a secondary layer. That secondary layer is what we call a sacrificial layer. That's what allows the mortar to bond with that secondary layer. Now that secondary layer will help to keep water out, but because it's not tied into all the flashings and penetrations, uh, it's not going to keep water out 100%. It's going to do most of it though. So we're looking for two layers. Typically that first layer is usually house wrap or something like that. And those usually fall into this uh, ASDM E2556 or equivalent, uh, zip wall, liquid applied WRBs and so on. That secondary layer, what we would like to see is something that meets ASDM spec D226. Now, there's an awful lot of extra language that goes with it. Type one, grade D, number 15 asphalt intended for wall application. The reason there's all this extra language is there is rolls of paper out there that look an awful lot like this D226, but they meet a different ASDM spec, D4869. That's a roofing felt. Um, Roofing felts are meant for roofs. They do a great job laying on a roof deck. The big issue is the perm rating. Most roofing felts have a perm rating of usually one or less, which is fine on roofs because most roofs are vented at the bottom and at the top. If we take that same roofing felt and put that over top of a house wrap that has a perm rating usually between five and eight, or sometimes much higher between 20, 30, 50, and vapor passes through that primary WRB of perm rating of five to eight, and it hits a paper that's got a perm rating of one or less, now we've got potential for water to get trapped in between, vapor to get trapped in between mold and mildew to develop. So by making sure that we've got a proper paper, the D226, that's either a type one or a grade D, uh, they've got a perm rating very similar to house wrap. It's got a perm rating of five to eight. So now that vapor can continue to pass through the primary and the secondary layer. Easy way to tell if we've got the right paper, it's going to be printed right on the label of that WRB. Now when it comes to the metal lap, typically we're seeing a 2.5 uh, self-furring corrosion resistant metal lap. Uh, there are options for welded wires and uh, uh, non, or I guess I'd say alternate lath, things like uh, fiberglass lath also. Now, we've all seen a sheet of lath. It's 27 inches tall, eight foot long. We don't want to start and stop at a corner. Anytime we do this, we've got a pretty good potential. There's going to be cracking in the corner stones. The reason is, especially with new construction, is that building settles. A lot of that movement shows up in the corner. Now, the same thing goes for our inside corners. We don't want to start and stop at the inside corners. We want to make sure that we're bending our metal lath and that uh, metal lath runs all the way through the inside corner. So this is what our corner details should look like. Both our paper and our lath need to come at least 12 inches around the corner and they must be uh, nailed into framing. So a lot of times that's going to be 16 inches, but the minimum would be 12. And that's how far we want to come around that corner. When it comes to our secondary layer of paper, we want to make sure that we're overlapping top over the bottom by at least two inches, and our vertical overlap, our side-to-side -side overlaps, should be about six to eight inches. Metal lath should be installed so that all four sides are overlapping. Vertical, you could probably get away with a half an inch of overlap, but the horizontal needs to be at least an inch. I think it's easier just to say, hey, we need an inch on all four sides. Now this is a picture of what we don't want to do. Uh, we've only got one layer of paper. We can see the gaps in between the metal lath. Now as this building warms up and expands and cools off and, and shrinks a little bit, we're going to get a lot of cracking and a lot of movement in between where that metal lath is not overlapped. And then also we don't see a full scratch coat on here. They just put an extra heavy set of mortar on the back of the stone and stuck that to the metal lath. We'll talk about why that's not acceptable coming up in a few slides. Building codes is that metal lath should always be installed horizontally, never vertically. Now, when they make a sheet of metal lath, it starts out as a smaller sheet of metal. They spray it with a, or coat it with a corrosion resistant material, score it, and stretch it. 
That stretched part is the 27 inch section. That's the weakest part of the metal lat. Uh, if you were to pull on that enough, you probably get some stretch out of it. The strongest part of metal lat is horizontal. And so code calls out, should always be installed horizontally. Now in the picture on the right here, I can see why they installed these two sheets vertically. Two sheets added right up to the window, which means they didn't have to do any cutting. The problem is, is we only are grabbing two studs across that 27 inch section. And if this building racks or moves at all, that weakest part of the lath is gonna flex and we'll probably get some cracking in the stone. When we run it vertically or horizontally across the wall, we're grabbing four, five, six, seven studs across that section and across the strongest part. Want to make sure that the metal lath is self-furring. It's either going to have some V-grooves through it or some dimples. The idea is that holds the metal lath off the paper just enough so that mortar can encapsulate the metal on all four sides. Uh, metal, if it's exposed to air and moisture, will start to rust. And we saw some of the flat laths because they were so tight to the wall, mortar couldn't get back in behind, and we saw some rusting. So make sure it's got either dimples in it or V-grooves in it. And then the best way to tell if metal lath is installed right side up or upside down, uh, some folks will look for the cups and look for cup up, cups up. Uh, some can tell by the sheen. Uh, Gary Malin, who was a part of the stucco industry for a long time, had a really great saying, it's installed properly. Uh, if it's gonna be like a good whiskey, it'll be smooth going down and rough coming up. So run your hand down, it should feel smooth. Bring your hand back up, it's gonna feel a little bit like a cheese grater. And when it's installed that way, those little cups are facing up so that when the contractor puts the scratch coat on, that mortar settles back into those cups. If it says upside down, those cups are facing down and out, and the mortar could pull away. Now, that's not something you will see in the building code. Uh, that is a metal lath manufacturer recommendation. Now, when it comes to our nail pattern, if we're going into wood framing, we want to make sure that the anchor gets in by three quarters of an inch, which means we need to add for the sheathing, the lath, maybe a rain screen if we're using one. Metal lath or into metal framing, we need three eighths of an inch. Again, 16 on center, about every six or seven inches vertically. Now, the reason that we want to go into the studs is one, they're obviously the strongest part, but number two, there's so much pressure in a stud that any water that may happen to travel down the shank of a nail or staple and maybe make its way through the tail, two layers of paper won't be able to get into that wall cavity because of the pressure of the stud. Um, if we miss with one or two staples, uh, that's probably going to be all right, uh, or nails. Um, the water that travels down there maybe a little bit makes its way through. Uh, but if we take that nail or staple gun and put thousands of holes all over the wall, missing the studs most of the time, but we could end up with wall cavities now where too much water is working its way through because that sheathing doesn't have enough pressure to keep all that water out and we could get walls that are saturated. So it's important to mark out those studs and make sure we're doing our best to hit those as we go down that wall. We are looking for a nominal half inch thick scratch coat typically using a type S or a type N uh, for that scratch coat, needs to cover 100% of the lath. And as it starts to cure, starts to set up a little bit, we need to go through and put some horizontal lines in that scratch coat. Now, if you remember the picture that we looked at earlier where they were just doing an extra heavy set of mud or mortar and sticking it directly to the lath, the problem is, is that mortar never squeezes out and covers all of the lath. You can see the exposed lath here. Anytime metal lath is exposed to air and moisture, it'll eventually start to rust. This is what we should see when we walk up and look at a proper scratch coat. This is a scratch coat that was a hair too thin. So how do we know if we've got a nominal half inch scratch coat? Easiest way to tell is if you can see the ridges of the metal lath through your, through your scratch coat, it's a hair too thin. Put it just a little bit thicker. That's what'll protect it from the air and moisture. Let's speak uh, for a few minutes around mortar recommendations. Again, these are just recommendations and not requirements yet. Um, eventually, I think they will become requirements. But right now, our recommendation is to start to move away from type N. Right now, we're only recommending type N for interior applications below 10 feet. The reason is uh, type N, when mixed to the proper sand and mortar ratio, which is what these ASTM specs speak to, um, we can get about a 50 PSI shear bond strength, the bond strength of that stone to the wall. 
And that's the requirement for code is 50 PSI. It's the bare minimum requirement to get by. We feel like getting a stronger bond strength makes more sense. Uh, so moving to a type S, when it's mixed properly, we start to get shear bond strength of about 100 PSI or better. And so we recommend the use of type S for interior, uh, any type of single family residential application, any commercial application below 10 feet. Anything in commercial above 10 feet, uh, any cement board application, we recommend using a modified mortar that meet these ANSI standards. Uh, the thing about a modified mortar is they start to get shear bond strength north of 300 PSI, so much, much better uh, bond strength. Now, uh, does it mean that if you're doing a single family or residential project with a tight fit, and let's say the stone's going up above where people are walking, you can still choose to use a modified mortar. That's not a bad idea, but it's not a requirement. If you're gonna use some type of an admixture, something for cold weather temperatures, we're not big fans of those types of products, often called antifreezes, uh, because of, uh, admixtures will accelerate the drying time. Anytime we accelerate drying, we lose some bond strength. But if you need to use one, just make sure that you follow that manufacturer's instructions. We don't want to install stones that have snow or ice or dripping water on them. They're not going to bond very well. And let's take a few minutes just to talk about tight fit applications. These are extremely popular uh, looks right now. Uh, quite a few of the jobs out there have requested tight fit. And if we were to talk about uh, most of the issues that we see out there, it's where a few of the stones have popped off the wall. And usually what happens is uh, you get a nice day when it's about 60 degrees outside, sun's hitting the scratch coat all day long, and you can end up with more that dries out too fast. What it usually looks like is a scratch coat that's, again, 20, 30 degrees warmer than the air temperature. Contractor back butters the stone uh, to a dry stone. They stick it to a dry wall. And as soon as that setting mortar hits that scratch coat, there's a battle between the setting mortar and the are in or to take the water out of the setting mortar into either the scratch coat or into the stone and a lot of times what you'll see is that that scratch coat wins because it sucks water faster than our stone does and so the recommendation is to make sure we're hydrating the scratch coat and hydrating the stone uh, if there's one thing that's in all of our installation instructions that everybody could take home with them it's to hydrate the scratch coat and hydrate the stone. It can be something as simple as a garden mist or a bug sprayer to hydrate the scratch coat, hydrate the back of the stones. Again, we don't want them dripping wet. But now when you back butter that stone and stick it to the wall, that mortar can dry at a normal rate. Now, when it comes to cold weather, we want to make sure that that mortar doesn't freeze. So let's make sure uh, that we are working in temperatures above 40 degrees, or if we know that the temperatures are gonna drop down into freezing, make sure that we're covering the stones uh, and heating inside. Dan, we'll take a quick pause here to see if there's any questions up to this point. You know, Jeff, you were so thorough. The only questions we had you addressed, one was on uh, the types of uh, collection to use for mortar, which you covered in table two the type N going and also type S and when to use modified. So I think that slide uh, addressed all the questions that we've had so far. So doing a great job. Thank you, Jeff. All right, we'll keep moving right along. Now, we didn't get a chance to spend too much time on it. And if you'd like to talk about it, we can maybe uh, talk later. But those ASTM specifications talk about the sand and mortar ratio. Uh, it is gonna be a bit tighter of a mix typically with brick and block that work on compression, then the units are stacked on top of each other. We're gonna see usually about a three part sand to one part mortar. Um, for manufactured stone, that's gonna be a little bit tighter mix, sometimes closer to two part sand to one part mortar. So when it comes to covering the back of the stone, we wanna make sure that 100% of the back of the stone is covered with about a half an inch of mortar. When we get up to that wall, we're gonna move it left or right or up or down to get mortar squeezing out around all four sides probably would look like this. This is probably a little bit on the messy side. And if you'll notice, we've got something wrong here. We've got a scratch coat that is smooth. We don't have the horizontal lines in it. Um, those horizontal lines are important to get a better mechanical bond. If we've got a smooth scratch coat like this, the stone will stick fine. 
when we come back months later after it's cured out and start pounding on the stone, it's going to be hard to get off the wall. But when that stone does finally pop off, the break bond point is usually that smooth scratch coat. Now, if we've got the horizontal lines in it, that mortar squeezes back into those lines. And now when we uh, push that stone on the wall, that setting mortar settles back into those lines. It gets more of a kind of like a tongue and groove lock. It's a much better mechanical bond. Now, if you come back months later and start pounding on that stone, you'll actually start ripping wire mesh off with it. If we're going to grout it, we'll leave a gap in between the stones, come back with a grout bag, wait until that joint is thumbprint hard, and then hit it with a wooden stick or a metal striking tool to finish the joint. Again, if you've uh, got your eagle eyes on today, you'll notice that we've got a scratch coat that is a hair too thin. Uh, you can see the ridges of the metal lap, and there's no horizontal lines raked into it. Stones popping off the wall. Um, another reason that we see this happening is uh, we've got, in this case, two big drops of mortar on the back of the stone. Uh, manufactured stone is a masonry product. We're going to absorb some water, and if there's an airspace back in behind the stone, we could pass water back into that airspace. And if you live in a freeze-thaw environment, now we've created a place for water to puddle up, and eventually with freeze-thaw, it's pushing on the back of that stone, causing it to pop off. But even in warmer climates, this can be a cause for stones to pop off. Now, in our installation instructions from the beginning of stone time, we've always said cover the entire back of the stone with mortar, just as we had shown earlier. We recently had to go back and add not just the perimeter, because we were still getting a lot of the four-side method. Now, again, if we're looking for 100% bond and somewhat is installed with this type of method or the two-drop method, we're only getting maybe 40 or 50 percent uh, bond with the back of that stone to the wall, and we've created a really nice contained airspace for water to puddle up into. If we've covered 100 percent of the back of the stone, there's no place for water to collect back into behind. So mixing this with hydrating the scratch coat and hydrating the stone, I think you'll find it's an amazingly strong bond we can get between the stone and that wall. If we're gonna use some type of protective treatment, uh, we don't recommend full face sealers. Just wanna make sure that it's a silane or a siloxane base. Uh, efflorescence, the beautiful white stuff that we get on masonry from time to time. Uh, in this case, you can see a little bit of efflorescence here. I'm gonna back the photo up. It's really not anywhere else on the wall. What we've got is a really long roof line and a small gutter that's not catching all that water. So it's shooting over top onto the CMU wing wall it doesn't have any cap on top. Now we can clean that efflorescence off by using a one part vinegar, five part water solution, uh, a little bit of uh, soft, bristle, uh, uh, soft bristle brush, and we can scrub a lot of that off. But if we don't come back and address the gutter issue and the lack of capping, that efflorescence will probably come back. Once we fix those, there's a pretty good chance that that wall system will eventually dry out and that efflorescence will go away. We like to also spend time talking about cleaning stones, but it's also a good idea to first talk about how do we keep our stone clean so that we don't have to clean it. Uh, if you drop a little bit of type S or type N on a stone, the best thing to do is let it sit for about 30 minutes to an hour. It'll start to lighten in color. And at that point, you can take a soft brush and brush that right off. A uh, good tip is just to have somebody on your crew uh, go through at lunchtime and also at the end of the day and clean off with a brush all the stone that's been installed. Unfortunately, in this picture on the right, a uh, contractor didn't do that. And this top third of the stone is the color it's supposed to be. This bottom part does have stone on it, but this is what it looks like after you use some type of acid on it. So we need to avoid uh, using any type of acid, no power washers, no metal brushes, Warm water, mild detergent, soft bristle broom will take care of most things. Should you happen to get a chip or a nick or a thumbprint in a, a stone right in a high visibility area, we do have touch-up kits that we can send out uh, that can surface stain over top of those spots. Now we like to talk about mock panels. Doesn't matter if it's residential or commercial. Uh, what that does is gives us a chance to make sure that we've got the right products. We've agreed on the right layers that are going on behind it where all the flashings are going, where all the material trans transitions are happening. Uh, it gives us a chance to make sure that we like either that tight fit or grouted look that's being called out. 
And uh, even in residential, uh, it's important to make sure that everybody agrees on what layers are going on when. Uh, that transition between the trades is extremely important, not just in commercial, but also in residential applications. If there's going to be some type of accessories or trim pieces, uh, these mock panels are a great time to make sure that we've included those, that we like the look of them. Um, a good time to make sure that if there's a mortar color that's being called out, that everybody likes that mortar color, uh, that we're getting a good blend of these stones on the wall. Uh, make sure that we don't end up with projects like this where the little stones uh, got at the bottom of the box got used up in one spot, where we've got some horizontal lines, uh, chalk lines that were never done, and we've got some really long head joints in there. If we can catch this in a mock panel, uh, there's a better chance these types of installs don't make it to the wall. Now, a lot of times in commercial, there'll be a really nice mock panel built showing all the different exterior uh, materials that are going on those buildings. In this case, this was a mock panel. The building ended up being five or six stories tall. They tore this down at the end, but it really gave them a good chance to work on the sequencing. And in this case, we have got a stucco band that's already been installed. Then the stone contractor came in with their paper, their lath, and their stone. And unfortunately, about six weeks or so later, in between the stone and the stucco, opened up a hairline crack because they're different types of materials, they move at different rates. And if there's no flashing present uh, in between that transition, a flashing piece like this, that crack will open up and now allow bulk water to run into that crack. And not just soak into our stone and hit our papers and drain down and get out, it runs into that crack, runs behind the paper, and now uh, that water is being held in and eventually causing an awful lot of damage to that wall system. And so having a mock panel, again, gives us a chance to bring all the trades out. Once we've agreed that the stucco guy is going first, we can agree that the stucco guy is putting in the flashing. And now when the stone guy shows up, uh, if that flashing isn't there, they know to go to the builder or the GC and say, hey, I can't install yet because the flashing isn't in. We know what kind of damage can happen if we don't get this, get this in place first. So to that point, there's a whole bunch of details in our guide uh, on how to handle all these. We're only going to handle a few of the more popular ones here. First one being clearance to grade. Building code says we need to be four inches to grade, two inches to a paved surface, half an inch if that paved surface is part of the foundation that the wall is on. And so think of a porch or a brick ledge. Now the reason we do that is we're not unlike a lot of the other cladding systems that are out there. Um, we need to make sure that there's enough clearance, that we're not wicking water, that we're not uh, bringing, uh, staining up from the dirt. Uh, it also gives an opportunity for termite inspection and typically it's a code requirement. We don't wanna bury wood into grade. We don't wanna bury brick down into grade and expose it to all those de-icing salts. East needs to have that clearance and so does our manufactured stone. Now some projects are pouring bumpers as part of the foundation. Uh, that gives that stone the look of it resting on something, also gets it up away from the de-icing salts. In this application, they bent some coil stock back in behind the two layers of WRB and the weep screed out over a piece of two-inch rigid foam, did that the whole way across this building. Now, as they come back in, they're still going to need to keep their stones or grade down three or four inches off, but now that stone looks like it's rested, uh, resting on something, supported by something. I think it's a much cleaner application. Now, anytime we transition from foundation to framing, code says we need to deal with this transition somehow. Now, if we break it at that sill plate, that gives us the ability to take the stone from below that flashing on down, either directly applied to the foundation or with metal lath, to keep it two inches off the grade and half an inch to that paved surface. Now, how we do that is there needs to be some self-adhered flashing, followed by the flashing piece that dumps the water out over the face of the stone. And if you'll see, there's a weep screed here, but if we follow this up, it says that weep screed is optional. The reason is that weep screed is a drainage point and a capillary break, followed by this flashing piece that is a drainage point and a capillary break. So it's a little redundant. So you could bring that stone down and eliminate that weep screed. It would look a little bit like this. If they had used a brown weep screed in here, it probably would have blended with that flashing and looked a little bit better. Or if they had eliminated 
that weight screen all together, they could have brought the stone right down to the flashing. Now the other option that we have is to put some self-adhered flashing tape again across that transition, carry our two layers of paper and our metal lath all the way down to our weep screed. But in this case, we need to stay four inches off the grade, two inches to that paved surface. Now, the reason that we want that self-adhered flashing tape is in this case, uh, we see this all too often, two layers of paper, and then the weep screed gets placed an inch below the sill plate. But if there isn't any self-adhered flashing tape put on that joint, it's going to be exposed to an awful lot of water and bugs that work its way behind that weep screen. So it's important to make sure we get that tape at that transition point. Stone coming up on a wainscot application, this is pretty common. What we want to see is the uh, non, uh, one layer of WRB either out over top of the flashing or some tape across the flashing. So that any water that gets behind our sliding travels down and gets dumped out. There's a bead of sealant underneath to keep water from traveling back up underneath the flashing piece. And then what you're seeing here is an L bracket. If you remember earlier, we talked about the maximum thickness for a stone is an average of two and five eighths. Our water table sills are gonna average the entire way across the face three inches because we want water to dump out past the face of our thickest stone. So at this point by code, this three inch deep piece no longer meets the requirement for an adhered veneer and we should have some type of a support below it. We'd like to see two of these brackets, either the A21 or A23. Uh, they need to be placed on the stud, so there will be some situations where a water table sill only has one of those brackets to support it. Now in this picture, you can see we got some cracking in the cornerstones. You can see that the transition was caulked shut. Any water that came down couldn't get out got pushed back in behind, and even though the metal lap was wrapped around this corner properly, the water got to that OSB, the OSB swelled and caused cracking in the stone. In this one, everything looked right, stone, water table fill, flashing, siding, but when we walked around the corner, you can see that flashing was nailed on top of the house wrap, no tape, and now any water that travels down is not gonna jump out, it's gonna get driven back in behind. Now, penetrations coming through the wall, I think this is probably one of the areas that gets missed sometimes, uh, but now is more important than it's ever been in the past. Uh, you can see the OSB here. This one's pretty common. Uh, usually we come through and stick our black paper over top and our metal lath and not do anything with those types of holes. Now, most of your primary WRB manufacturers will have some details on how to seal and flash around those penetrations. Uh, we tell contractors, if it's not your job, then this is what you should see or something similar to it when you walk up to the job. Now, the reason that I think that these types of penetrations that are not handled properly are more important uh, is that we're building differently. Uh, we're building homes and doing blower tests. We're checking them for energy efficiency. We're trying to seal up every uh, leak that we can. Now, I live in an older house, and this is a picture of a single pane window in my house at least a few months ago when I used to travel <laughs> and could get out. Uh, my wife would turn the heat up. And what it shows is that differential heat and humidity between the outside and the inside caused condensation when they met. Now, this is also happening in the cavities of my walls, but that's okay. I live in an old, drafty house. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as breathing. But that's not how we build now. We're not going to go back to building that way. And so a small hole like this becomes a lot more dangerous. Now, there's a construction instruction is one of the websites that we listed. Uh, we took this from them or borrowed it, I should say. But it's a good example of how just a little bit of warm, moist air can make its way through an electric socket. It can warm up that one wall cavity. And if there is a hole in our sheathing like this that hasn't been sealed and flashed, that's the point where hot and cold are going to meet, and condensation will just drip and drip and drip down that sheathing, and three years, five years, seven years down the road, we'll start to get some rot there. So it's important to make sure that those uh, penetrations are sealed up properly. Vertical transitions between dissimilar materials, we want to make sure that we've got some type of a soft joint, allowing those materials to expand and contract at different rates, not opening up large cracks for bulk water to run into. And the same thing goes for windows. We've got a window, metal window frame here. You can see the hairline cracks that's starting to open up. 
Now, most window manufacturers in their installation instructions will call out that any siding that goes up against their window, they would like a gap around all four sides to allow that window to be able to expand and contract without causing damage to the window or to that cladding material. So it would look a lot like this. We've got some head flashing on the top and our soft joint underneath. This allows any water that travels down our stone cladding to get out of that wall system past the face of the stone. Same thing down the sides, 3 8 gap with back the rod and sealant, and then also underneath. Now on a project, it's gonna look a little bit like this. The gap between our window and our stone, I would suggest that probably from the sidewalk on in, everybody, well, if you're looking for it, will be able to see it. From the sidewalk on out to the street beyond, I don't think it's gonna be noticeable. But what that soft joint does is allows that window to be able to expand and contract without causing damage to the cladding, or worse yet, causing damage to that window, causing it to fail early, uh, which could allow water into that building um, through the flashing pieces that have cracked. Uh, so this is what we often see is some type of a soft joint around a window filled with baccarat and sealant. Um, unfortunately, to me, it just doesn't clean up the look. We lose the clean edges of that window. I don't know how well caulk is going to stick to stone. Um, it is waterproof in the middle, but water can soak in around the edges. And so Boral did come out as an option, um, a product called Flex and Dry Tape. It's an expanding foam tape that has been impregnated with a fire retardant, a bug repellent, and an air and moisture repellent. And when it's installed, uh, it begins to expand and can fill up any of those gaps between stone and windows, stone and door jams, uh, penetrations. But what it does is gives us a product that um, I, I think looks a little bit better, it's easier to apply, and the lifespan on this product is measured more in decades uh, rather than years that often happens with caulk. And so is a alternative to caulk for any of those soft joints. We'll spend a few minutes on roof lines, uh, water coming down here. You can see we've got two issues, one water wicking up, but also water shooting over past that gutter. And so what we would like to see is a piece of kick out flashing um, underneath a step flashing. This is a three-sided piece that directs any water that comes down back into that gutter. We've got a house here, we can see the water shooting out over top. And instead of using kick out flashing, they just use step flashing, a two sided piece, which means back in this corner, there was a little gap. And unfortunately, that directed water back in behind the stone, and we ended up with rot back in behind. So the other problem we've got is that stone's installed right down onto the roof line. Now, when we come back through and staple our metal lath on top, we're gonna put a bunch of holes in the step flashing that water is gonna wick up and hold up against. So we've got two options, leave two inches of clearance between the roof line and the stone, or the other option would be to put in a filler board. That way you can bring your step flashing up, flash out over top, and now it looks like that stone is supported by something or resting on something as it goes up the roof line. When it comes to caps, we'd have, like to have at least an inch of overhang, uh, two inches would be better. Uh, when it comes to retaining walls, entry walls that are masonry and nobody's living back in behind, we can come down to two inches to grade, half an inch to a paved surface. And then the last thing I want to cover is just around wood columns on porches. Uh, we like to see some flashing at the bottom to keep water from um, entering underneath the stone and getting to that wood column. But I would suggest that our bigger problem is often the cap on top. Anytime we've got a sky-facing joint, whether it's filled with grout, or with caulk, it's eventually going to leak. And if all we've done is put two layers of paper and metal lath around the outside, water will work its way in. It only takes about a year uh, to get this look and about three years to get that. And so our recommendation is once you have your two layers of paper around the outside, there should be some flashing that comes up, across, and back down. And then put your metal lath on. And that way, any water that makes its way through hopefully gets onto that flashing and gets out rather than back in, in, uh, inside the wood column. I would suggest laying uh, that backup system out of masonry rather than wood. Uh, better chance that that masonry is gonna hold up. 